Welcome to the fifth video in this series on melody. In our last video, we wrapped up the first phase of the series by discussing larger forms and how to give your music structure. In this video, we are going to kickstart phase two by discussing a specific strategy of using chord progressions to write a melody. Before we go any further, I want to take a quick moment to thank my amazing patrons. I wouldn't be able to put out weekly videos like this if it weren't for your support, and I appreciate each of you more than you know. This week, a special shout out goes to my newest patron, Moritz Paul. I'm glad to have you on board, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you better on Patreon and Discord. If you want to show your support for this channel by becoming a patron or even buying me a cup of coffee, the links are in the description of this video. All proceeds go towards helping me make payments for my tuition. So with that, let's get started. From here on out, the very first step of every strategy we tackle will be to first identify what type of motif we want to build, and then what the local peak of our phrase will look like. Since we're tackling a harmony-first approach to writing melodies in this video, let's focus on manipulating pitch and rhythm in our motif. This type of motivic statement tends to work really well with a chords-first approach. We'll also use pitch as our peak parameter, so our focus will be on building towards the highest pitch in the entire phrase. With this in mind, let's take a look at what we're working with. For this approach, our next step is to start with a chord progression. Here's ours. When using an existing chord progression to inspire a melody, one of the simplest strategies you can use is to start by writing a motif over just the first one or two chords. Since our progression has eight chords in it, with one chord per measure, it's a perfect match for the prevade method that we've used in the past. We can dedicate two measures each to the presentation, repetition, variation, and deconstruction. So if we focus just on these first two chords, we can kickstart our melody by simply picking a couple of chordal tones to place in the melody line. I'm not gonna go crazy, just typically I wanna stick to just one or two chordal tones per measure. It's a great place to start. Now, these notes will form the foundation of our melody and typically end up being important to the identity of the motivic statement. So choose carefully. Something you can consider when selecting which notes to start with is the personality of different scale degrees in each chord. The first, or the root, of a chord has a very strong personality. It helps to emphasize which chord you're working with in the harmony. However, make sure not to use it too many times at the beginning of new chords. If your melody overuses the root on beat one of the chord change, it will lose some of its independence from the underlying harmonic voices. This can have a negative impact on the personality of your music by blurring the lines between what is harmony and what is melody. Another strong option is the fifth. It's a neutral sounding tone and can be used to add additional stability to your music when used on strong beats of your melody. The third is less stable, but it's responsible for establishing the emotion of a chord. After all, the third scale degree determines if a triad is major or minor. So it's a solid choice when you want to really nail home the emotional core of your underlying harmony. Finally, color tones, including sevenths and all extensions, help add color to your melody. They emphasize a kind of independence between your melody and your harmony, since they aren't used as commonly in most popular music. They can even be risky notes to emphasize, since they don't play a very strong role in connecting the melody to the harmony. But if you're brave enough to use them, they can create incredible atmospheres and personalities to your music. Once you've decided on your chordal tones, you should have a decent starting point for writing your initial motif. The next step will be to develop that motif a bit further by adding some embellishing tones. Embellishing tones are any notes in a melody that are not included in the underlying harmony. 
We've already covered this topic at length in the series on harmony. But as a reminder, here's a short list of common embellishing tone types. Here, the main idea is to try and find ways to help transition one chordal tone to another. Consider what kind of personality you want your motif to have. As a general rule, the more embellishment tones you use, the more energy your motif will have. However, remember what we discussed earlier in this series. A motif does not need to be complicated. So, trust your gut and go with what sounds right. While you're adding embellishing tones, you can also adjust the rhythm of your motif to better shape the personality of your music. Once you're ready and have a strong motif that you want to work with, the last step is to apply what you've learned in the previous videos. Use your motivic statements to first build towards the local peak of the phrase, and then back away from it. Let's take a look at how this process might look in real time. All right, so here we go. We've got our chord progression right here. Uh, it's the same one from earlier, but let's give it a quick listen to make sure that it's fresh in our ears again. go. Uh, it's a pretty nice example actually of how a chord progression in the key of C major can still sound sad. The way this works is I'm focusing on using the tonic and the dominant, uh, which means the one in the five chord of the uh, C major chord to help establish that it's in C major. But other than that, I'm using pretty much all minor chords. We've got, uh, we've got a D minor, A minor, E minor, another D minor. Um, yeah. So focusing a lot on those minor triads that exist within the key. But that's not what this video is about. Let's get back to work. So let's focus real quick. We'll mute these and focus just on the first two chords. All right, so since this is a predominantly sad key, I do think that helps, or chord progression, I should say. I think what I want to focus on, let's go with E for now. It's happy, so let's establish a bit of this is in the key of C major go to G and then let's say really bring home that F because that's the third the F is the third we have the first third and fifth so this voicing right here is an inversion technically because we don't have a bass line so this lower line is going to act as our bass line for us um so the third is going to give us a nice emotional feel to it and then yeah, why not? Let's go down to the D. Let's go to the root. Just because we haven't yet, we'll have a nice descending motion. So this will sound like... Let's listen to it real quick. Nice! All right, so already you can hear an idea is forming. All right, so this forms the foundation, the core personality of our motif. From here, it's a simple matter of adding some embellishments and changing the rhythms around a little bit so let's see what i can do here typically i personally like to start with a bit of um uh syncopation i like to start on the off beat it's just something i find myself doing a lot so let's shorten this e to make it come on the second beat i like that so da, 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 da. let's try that let's do a Let's do a neighbor tone real quick. And then we'll have the D come in a little bit early. And you know what, instead of doing that, let's have this come on an off beat as well. Cause I didn't like how that rushed that sounded. You know what, why not? Let's just do it in another second beat. Let me make the first measure in that way. Oops. Let's try going down instead. I like that. I like that. It doesn't sound quite that sad. Which it doesn't have to. There's no saying that it has to be sad. You know, instead of doing that, let's pick this last change because I don't need to go too in-depth with this. It's just an example. All right, 
right, so there we go. We have our motif. All right, so we focused on those main ideas, established the chordal tones, add some embellishing tones, play with the to, with the um, rhythm a little bit. So now the next trip will be to repeat the rhythmic idea with small variations. So we're using the Prevate technique for this video. Remember, Prevate stands for present, repeat, variation, and deconstruct. So what we can do here, ah, right off the bat, the E works, but let's take that G and change it to an A. So now we're mostly chordal tones here again. And then G, B, G, so this isn't gonna work very well, so let's move it up. And let's try, we might get try an F. An F would be tricky, that's a non-chordal tone right now because we're not using the G dominant. So this would be a color tone, it would be adding a seventh in the melody. So let's keep moving ahead. So now we're going to do the, we've done present, we've done repeat with minimal variation. Now it's time to repeat with a much stronger variation. So one thing that we can do here, so E works again. This time, however, instead of going to the G, let's hit the B. And when this is, I typically, when I'm doing prevade, I like to hit my local peak here in the moment of the motif because it's near the end and gives a short amount of time to come back down so let's try let's try and then we'll remove at least some of that and we'll bring that over so uh then this next one is a d minor so let's come all the way up to a d we'll hold it for two beats and then come down to A. Let's give this a listen to. I don't care much for that, so let's try doing the seventh. The C would be the seventh of a D major, or D minor. And there we go. So we've got a presentation, repetition, variation. Now let's deconstruct. So now we don't need to focus so much on sticking strictly to the idea, but let's say we'll do, so we've got G, B, D, F. Let's go with B and we'll come down to G and then we'll do, um, no, let's not mix, let's not mimic the lead or the peak I should say I'm sorry this is all unedited this is all live as I record this so it's not smooth or anything but I feel like it's important that you see this entire process uh, like unfold so now let's see how this sounds at the ending That sounds a pretty good way. So we're coming back down. Now, the thing about the end of a phrase, the deconstruction for the prevade method, it doesn't need to come all the way back down. It doesn't have to. Uh, it, we want to bring it down to where you want to take off in the next phrase. All right, so let me rephrase that. So wherever the ending of a phrase leaves you, that's where you're going to be picking up from for the next phrase. So when you're designing the ending of a phrase, you want to make sure that you're establishing an area for the beginning of the next phrase to come. I know that's using the word phrase a lot. So this C could come all the way down. It could come lower. It could come higher. Basically, wherever I want to pick up in the very next phrase or the continuation of this melody. I hope that makes sense. But let's give the whole thing a listen. And with that, we have reached the end of another video. I hope it was helpful. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing it with anyone else you think might find it useful. I want to take another quick moment to thank my amazing patrons. You guys are incredible, and I appreciate each of you more than you know. I also want to thank each of you who are watching these videos and showing your support for the channel in other ways. Your kind comments, messages, and emails help keep me inspired and excited to make new content.
So until next time, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music.